Hello, this is Hunter McDermott with another uh, Anyone Can Play Guitar video. Um, this is something I wanted to do, uh, or was going to do anyway, rather, and I figured let's turn the camera on and just kind of see how it goes. Uh, if you're watching this, it means that we were mostly successful, maybe totally successful, but I don't know that yet, so we'll see. Here's the thing. So I got a new guitar uh, a little while ago, a couple weeks ago. I had the Eastman Archtop, and I, I sold that, and I bought a uh, an Ibanez AF200, which is a lot like my other Ibanez, which is the AS200. It's the same like series, the Prestige series, but uh, it's a full hollow body. It's like a proper Archtop guitar. Um, and I really like it. I got it used, even though it's like in basically new condition. Um, and the guy who sold it to me had taken the pick guard off. Uh, he never, like, as soon as he got it, he took the pick guard off and never used it. Um, so when he sold it to me, he he put it back on. And I noticed when I got it that it was covered in the plastic from the factory. So he really had never used it. Um, so me being me <laughs> wanting to get like every sticker off of everything i buy ever i peeled off the uh, the little sticker that's on this thing and discovered that the binding was uh coming loose or had come loose at this at this bottom end here uh so me being me <laughs> as well i uh bought some super glue and i just sort of haphazardly glued it um not really realizing that it I didn't line it up properly, so it's still it's you know very minor uh, here. You can see how it's not quite uh, doesn't quite line up on the bottom there like it's supposed to, and that's you know just something that bothers me. It should be better. Um, so anyway, I glued it, and then uh, of course I I got glue all over it and you know screwed it all up, and it's on. Um, this edge is not <laughs> because it's not flush and that's why this is too short. Um, and I sort of tried to like, uh, file or not file, um, sand the glue off, but I don't, I didn't at the time have a high enough grit of sandpaper to do that properly. So it's basically just scratched all to hell. Now, of course, this is sometimes known as a scratch plate. That is what it is for. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to, if there are scratches on here, I want them to be from playing, not from haphazardly gluing and then sanding uh, a thing. So here's the goal. I'm going to, I've got some, um, some acetone, which will help me uh, melt the super glue that's on there so I can get it back to kind of its starting state of being disconnected. Um, I, th I thought that I would uh, sort of start from this edge that's sort of loose. There's like a, a little bit of a gap here that I might be able to thread some uh, dental floss through there. And then once it's through there, dip, dip it in the acetone and then pull it through and kind of like scissor it along the edge is my plan. I don't know if that's actually going to work. Um, so hopefully that will uh, dissolve that super glue and then we'll be right, right back where we started. Um, and then I've got uh, my super glue. So I will try to do a better, cleaner job of it this time, making sure that it's lined up <laughs> properly. Uh, and then I've got some sandpaper, like way too much sandpaper. It goes from like, 120, which I won't be using to 3000. So I might start with like 800 and kind of work my way up and just sort of try to buff these uh, scratches out and then, you know, remove any glue bits that I may add to this in my, in my gluing. And then I don't know if I'll need it or not, but I have some polish here that might help uh, get it back to new. And then I could scratch it up the way it's meant to be scratched um, by my pick. I've also got a beer, so there you go. All right, so let's get started. First step is to try 
to get this dental floss through this uh, gap. I'm not sure how easy that will be. <clears throat> so I'm just going to push up because it's sort of loose. Um, let's see, you can kind of see it's sort of loose and not fully glued in that area. Now, of course, throughout this entire thing, I also want to make sure I don't uh, break the binding. Because if it's broken, I'm out of luck because I don't know how to make or at least I'm never going to make my own binding. That's too too much. I will hope that I can get through this sort of bending without destroying it. Okay, so that worked. So far, so good. We've got the floss going through a small area. And so it goes about just around the corner there. Uh, I didn't glue past this point here but all of this is glued. All right, so let us make a take a safety precaution while I'm thinking about it, and let's just tie a knot in the edge of this, both edges of the floss, so I don't um, accidentally pull it through when it's covered in acetone. This should be enough. Doesn't need to be much. Um, let's see how that goes. Yeah, okay, should be good. Do that on the other side. <clears throat> okay. All right, so we should be safe from losing that now. All right, so we got our nail polish remover, which is 100% um, acetone, same stuff, um, which should melt, help melt the Gorilla Glue, super glue that I used um, to put this on in the first place. So, um, how do I want to do this? Let's see. Now that we've kind of got a little bit of a safety want to dip kind of the middle of this in. I'm hoping it sort of absorbs it a little because dental floss is kind of porous. Okay. All right. So here we go, Let's pull through, and I'm going to kind of grab it like this, sort of like scissor it. Already cutting a little bit of it. Um, probably need to dip it again. And it'll shred, I'm sure, so that's not going to be fun. It's already shredding. <laughs> it's okay. As long as we get it glue melted, we can do all the cleanup, and we will have to do some cleanup later. Okay, so pulling the wrong way. Let's see, the correct way. Okay, this is definitely working. Something's working. I could probably get away with just sort of putting acetone directly on here. I don't know if we could do that. Um, that's a good idea or a bad idea. Okay, it might be that the acetone is not doing much, <laughs> and I'm just kind of sawing it apart, which is fine with me. Okay, so we snapped 
that piece, but we're still threaded. That will probably happen again before we're all done. <clears throat> we might lose this one. Okay. All right. Made some progress, though. Let's get another piece here. Not sure I needed to tie the knots like I did. All right, should be easier to thread through now because you've got it's more of a separation. All right, there we go. <clears throat> I'll hold this up to the camera somewhat so you can see. I'm probably failing at that. All right. Okay, let's see. We'll hold it here. And let's see if we can just dip the whole thing. Okay. All right. Now, kind of pull. Okay, yeah, it seems like the acetone definitely is making a difference. Which is good, because I was hoping that it would. Kind of pulling it through and pulling it along somewhat. Trying not to shred it too much. Come on. <laughs> okay, making more progress. We're almost to the end. <clears throat> Very easy to thread it now. This part's still basically dipped, but we'll do it again. Almost to the end there. We're gonna need one more piece, or maybe we can sort of break it, snap it. Nah, I don't want to risk doing that. All right, one more piece ought to be good. Okay. All right, back to the edge. All right, we got it. Cool, okay. Uh, that actually worked. <laughs> I'm pleased. So now we've got, um, the binding is back to kind of where it was when I first started. Um, and Theoretically, I'm going to have to probably sand the edge of the the inner edge there just to make it smooth again for glue application and to get rid of any glue that's there so that this will sit more flush like it is supposed to do so we can get this edge to meet the edge of the of the inner piece of the pick card. So, uh, let's go with something like um, this part can be kind of coarse. 600, let's go 600. Get this out of the way. Take another swig. All right, so I'm going to feed this through. I don't actually need to, do I? And I'm trying to make sure I don't pull off, pull the binding off more than it already is. And I also want to make sure I don't destroy it in the process. So let's see, I'm going to just kind of hold 
this down and pull. It makes more sense to go along this way. <laughs> Otherwise, I end up. Okay, so that is working better. Feels pretty good. All right, let's do just a little bit on the other side, the binding side, just get the rest of that glue off. Again, trying not to destroy it in the process. That may very well happen. Um, how do I want to do this? Let's see. Just do something like that instead of sawing, maybe. That's looking pretty good, smooth under there. Now I looked sort of defeatedly after my initial screwing up um, at replacement fit guards. <laughs> And there are, you can find this particular model of pick guard, but it's the only place I could find it was a, a shop um, across the pond. So it would cost like hundreds some odd dollars to get it here. And it's, it, it is itself kind of expensive. Um, Cause the guitar is made in Japan. And, uh, Though Ibanez has um, makes guitars all over the place, that's kind of where this one this one came from, and maybe the parts would come from. And here's one thing I'm not sure about: is that uh, if I'll ever be able to get the binding kind of flush, especially around that edge there. It might be, and I didn't look closely enough when I first got it, but it might be that it just was never lined up there, which, I don't know, I'm trying to decide how much I care about that. Clearly I care, or I wouldn't be going through this much trouble for a pick guard, but, uh, but yeah, so I looked into trying to get another pick guard, and the specific one for this model of guitar is very expensive and hard to get. And if I wanted to get one that's like it, assuming that the measurements would be right, or perhaps get one that's uncut and then cut it or have it cut. Um, one thing I think that's really neat about this guitar and the, the pick guard included is that the binding is has got this like neat texture on it, and I am sure that this will not work, but um, it's too bright to see. But it's kind of, um, it's not just white, and it's not just cream. It's kind of got a little bit of a pattern in it. It almost looks like bone. It's not, but it looks like it's 
sort of trying to look like that, which is neat. Uh, and the binding on the rest of the guitar looks like that too. So if I were to get another one, even if I could get one with the same uh, number of plies here, which I think is pretty similar to what's on like a Gibson L5, I would, uh, it wouldn't have that creamy kind of distinctive look that matches the rest of the guitar. So that's another reason why I want to just try my hand at this. Yeah, I was hoping that once I sanded it, it would reach, but it looks like it's just not gonna. I can't see any specific spots where it's still got glue on it where that wouldn't work. So that's fine. I wish it would be flush because I feel like that's how it's supposed to be, but it looks like there's just not enough binding material there to reach. But we can get a little bit closer and more importantly, we can get it cleaner. Okay. Let's see. All right, so the next step um, is gluing. Now, of course, the glue will take like a day to set, I guess. So um, once we glue that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll cut and we'll come back uh, tomorrow and see where we are. Um, now I wonder, so we've got, let's see. Brush, bought one that comes with a brush, sort of built in, which I was hoping would make it a little less messy. I don't have a lot of experience gluing things. I think I built one plain model when I was a kid. That was it. Now I do know that you that I'm going to be able to sand this after the fact. So what I'm hoping is. If I'm a little sloppy and I get some on the rest of the pick guard, I'm going to be buffing that out anyway. Um, the main thing is just um, let's plan before I start putting the glue down. That's just what I did last time. Uh, so the plan would be to get it on there. And I think I can hold it in place for a minute or so just to make sure that it's not going to move. And then I can set it aside. Uh, and last time I had like a rubber band and I just sort of put the rubber band here and here and it kind of held it tight. I'm not sure I actually need to do that. But another thing that was bugging me is that when I glued it, uh, not only was it not lined up at the edge, but the sort of back and forth uh, dimension on this was off. So like it was raised more on one side of the pick guard than it was on the other. It wasn't flush like it's supposed to be and is on the rest of it there. So I need to do a better job of gluing it this time around. And again, I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to do that. So last time, and maybe I'll just do that again because I can't think of anything better. I'll just kind of hold, hold this out and um, run the brush of glue, try to get as little glue on the brush as possible and just kind of run it along. I'm going to start at this end and work my way to the end end. And then I'm going to try to sort of pull it, making trying to make sure that it's flat and flush. Um, it is very possible and probably likely that I will get glue all over myself. But we'll see. Um, so I don't have any other tools or anything. I don't have like a vice or I don't know. I don't know what else would even be helpful. Okay, take so another zip and uh, and dive in. All right. Let's see if we can get the minimum amount of glue on here. Do not need much.
All right, let's see. I kind of hold it out like this, kind of push it. There's a little bit of a gap there. And I want to just run the glue. the channel as far as I can take it. Yeah, I'm already getting glue on the on the pick guard, that's okay. It's all right. A touch more. Yeah, there's a little bit more I think. Gonna run out of time here. I don't hurry. Okay. All right. Now try to get it as flush as possible on this end and even. And even here. Put pressure on it. So it's old. Let's see, how is that looking? It looks pretty good, I think. It won't be possible to do it perfectly. <laughs> All right, let's hold that firm for a minute or so. Looks like it's already starting to kind of create a bond. The good thing, it would be very annoying, but the good thing is I now know my acetone and floss method is actually effective, so that's good. All right, a little bit longer, and then we'll cut, and uh, I'll come back tomorrow, and we'll see where we are. I am a little bummed that that's not flush, but again, I don't think there's anything I can do about that. It's just there's not enough binding material to reach, and I didn't look closely enough when the guitar came to know if that was even a thing. Another thing that was bugging me is like I was able to kind of look through um, the edge uh, here and kind of see little little gaps, which I can actually still see, though they're very minor. I mean, I can see gaps across the whole thing, actually. Let's see. Hmm. That's already starting to hold. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a bummer. I want it to be I'm just holding it up to the light now uh, so I can see, see if there's light coming through. And there totally is, which is probably just a result of my haphazard sanding. I made it a different shape. And also I think when they do this um, for real, they are able to kind of like um, not clamp it. I've seen it to where they put it on the on a work surface and kind of like put nails around the edge and then kind of wedge pieces of wood between the nail and the and the pick guard to kind of make sure that there's equal pressure across the whole thing. Um, but already, this is better than I did it last time. It's lined up uh, as bad as bad as good as I can do. And my only concern about the gaps is that that means that that's just that's the glue is not having an effect at that spot, you know, which seems bad. Um, but anyway, let's see, where was that rubber band? But anyway, I'll get, a, I'll get a rubber band and I'll put it here and here and uh, maybe put a weight on top of it just to keep it uh, stable or keep it flat overnight. Come back and then the idea will be 
assuming that it stays and is good, um, to then sand, sort of go um, heavy to lighter and lighter and lighter and kind of buff out the scratches and remove the glue that I got on parts of the pit guard. I'm just sort of tidy it up and then we'll see where we are and if we uh, we get it smoothed out and we want to and we see a need to kind of shine it up then we can use this polish but that's where we are uh, thanks for tuning in and we'll come back after this is set okay I'm back uh, it's the same night I thought maybe this isn't a good idea but I want to sort of drop fill i guess is the right term the uh the gaps that i see here just kind of make sure that they're full filled with glue um and then you know i'll be getting glue all over everything but i'll be able to sand it down and kind of make it nice is my thinking um so let's Let's try it. It's not going to be all that exciting. I'm just putting glue all over the place recklessly. Um, but yeah, let's just see how we get along here. Just going to kind of paint it across. I have plenty of sanding to do. And I'll try to let the top set. And then um, flip it over and do the other side. And then let it really set over overnight. This is maybe the worst idea ever. But it's too late to go back now. Hmm. Just want to make sure. Just want to make sure this thing's glued to heck. And when I get to sanding, it's not going to crack on me or anything. Get that edge. Okay. Flip it over. Gonna let it sort of dry, but I'm not actually going to do that. Let's just go for broke. Hope is that sanding and polishing will <laughs> um, hide all of my mistakes. So the fun thing is. I've had this off the guitar for the past couple weeks as I've been futzing with it. And I figure, worst case scenario, it's just ruined, <laughs> which isn't great, but you know, whatever. The guitar looks fine, looks good, still looks good without the pick guard. And, you know, if in the future I come into some money or something, I can always, you know, have one made or buy a proper replacement. So it's fine. It's just kind of, you know, it's that this is valuable to me uh, just as an experience. So if this works, great. If it doesn't work, it's a bummer, but it's fine. And uh, Okay, so that's a whole buttload of glue on there, which has seemingly, effectively, sort of filled those holes that I was seeing, which makes me feel better. Um, let's see. That's just about it. So 
a lot of glue. <laughs> Sorry. I will get some fresh air after this for sure. All right, that's pretty much every gap I can see. And then we'll, uh, we'll sort of clamp it in our makeshift way um, with this rubber band. And then I'll stick a weight on top of it once it's cured somewhat so I don't glue the weight to it or it to something else. All right, cool. All right, now I will see you tomorrow. All right, we are back. It is the next day, just about 24 hours later. Um, this guy <laughs> uh, I had sitting here overnight with a, uh, a, ke a kettlebell on top of it, which was probably unnecessary, but I don't know, just something to keep it flat. And then also had this rubber band on there. Uh, both of which have done a little bit of sticking. But that's fine. Whatever is on there, we will theoretically sand away. Um, got a little bit glued to this guy, too. But anyway, that's okay. Um, so I'm thinking I've got my um, uh, sandpaper here. I've got an 800, 1,000. 2,000 and 3,000. I don't know how many of those I will need. I have others if I need it. Um, I read that if you soak the sandpaper before using it, it helps prevent that the bits that you sand off from sort of building up on the sandpaper itself, which if I'm going to be, for the glue part is gonna be fine. But once I get to the sort of finer bits where I'm trying to, um, get these scratches out that I had originally created, then it's going to be more important that I don't uh, scratch it further while I'm trying to buff it. Um, so we'll see. I don't, I figure it, it, soaking it won't hurt us at least. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. So I think I'm going to get the 800 out and just kind of go to town. Um, but actually, before that, let's see. Since we've got all this glue, I might start with something a little bit more abrasive. We're using this 600. That's probably still too late, but let's just give it a shot, see where we end up um, with this. We're going to be scratching the thing all to hell, <laughs> but that's uh, okay. We're going to get the glue off. And then um, they'll worry about making it look pretty. Okay, let's go a little bit heavier. And I realize that the more sanding I do, the more potential damage I do to the plastic. But that's okay. We're experimenting here. All right. This is 400. Try one, one more, uh, more course, and see how we get on. 
this is 320. Just to get the, just to remove the majority of the glue is the plan. Might have to um, experiment with putting some acetone down to sort of soften it. But I don't want to accidentally, you know, remove the gluing that I want to be there. get um, like a cotton swab. Um, I could probably do it with this piece of paper towel maybe. See if we can dab some acetone on there just to kind of loosen it up a little bit. Without doing any damage to the bits that I want glued. All right, yeah, that's helping out quite a bit. Okay. Acetone approach for a little bit. That seems more effective than sanding at this point. So like this spot right here, it's pretty much what I want to get to. You can't see that, but I've got a bit of glue still uh, showing everywhere else. But that spot looks like what I'm aiming for. So I'm trying to get every other spot to look like that. Kind of see in the light. This corner is being pretty stubborn. Probably because I glommed a butt ton of glue on there. Imagine that. Oops. Cotton swab would probably be better for this. I might grab something like that. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna go get some swabs. I'll be right back. Okay. Let's 
give this a whirl. I can put, kind of concentrate on one area just to verify that we can actually get this stuff off. Should be able to, but you know, that'd take a lot more work than I'm anticipating. And again, I might end up just messing up everything that I've done by accidentally dissolving the glue that I don't want to dissolve. Um, let's see. It's definitely softening it, but it's still there. Too much of it is still there. Okay. Yep, we're progressing very slowly. <laughs> I might be better off just kind of like dripping some on there and kind of letting it sit so it can soften. And then go in with the elbow grease. Again, I'm, I'm hoping that I only target the glue that I want to target, that I don't accidentally undo the binding, which would defeat the purpose of all of this. Once I get it to a certain thinness, uh, we'll go back to sanding, I think. Just gonna make sure it's soft enough. See where we are. <clears throat> yeah, okay. I think we're just going to need to do this a lot more with the acetone. I can scrape a little bit my nail. The interesting thing I learned um, watching great video by Ken Parker. He has this channel on YouTube called um, Arch Toppery. Or at least that's like the series. I can't remember if that's the name of the channel. But he is a guitar builder uh, who, after years of making various different styles of guitar, um, specifically the Fly, the Parker Fly, which is a guitar you've probably seen but haven't really thought too much about. At least that's how it was for me. Um, so he had Parker Guitars, and I don't know how big a company that was, but uh, that's what he did for a while, and then eventually he sold it, and then eventually that company went either out of business or got sold again. I don't remember exactly, but in any case, Ken himself was no longer part of it. And uh, 
So he's now dedicated himself and his shop, which as far as I can tell is still is basically just him by himself, um, to building archtop guitars. Um, and so he's got this really great uh, YouTube channel where he just details his process and he'll do a whole video where he's just like carving uh, an arched top and sort of talking about bracing or doing a special episode where he just kind of like shows you around the shop and shows you all the different vices that he has, um, like mechanical vices in, in the shop from all these different eras and how he's modified them to do what he needs them to do, stuff like that. So it's really cool. It's really interesting. And uh, if you're into videos like what you're watching now, where just somebody does something, <laughs> uh, you will really like that site especially if you're into guitar stuff. Uh, but I bring it up because he was talking about, um, he studied under um, John, um, is it John DeQuisto? No, John D'Angelico and then DeQuisto. I can't remember his name, his first name. Um, but DeQuisto, so uh, D'Angelico built these beautiful sort of deco inspired arch tops that have become, you know, collector's items. It's like the Lloyd lore kind of, of guitars. And then he trained uh, DeQuisto in, in his practice. And then DeQuisto trained uh, Ken Parker. So he was talking about uh, Jimmy, that's his name, Jimmy DeQuisto. Um, building a guitar for uh, Jim Hall, jazz guitar player Jim Hall, and how the way that you do it, and I didn't realize this, is you build the guitar with the wood and you leave a space for the binding, you make the binding, and then you um, put the binding on, and then after all of that, you go and you uh, paint, you know, add the finish to the guitar, whatever that happens to be. And then you go back uh, with, I don't know, I'm assuming a chisel of some of some kind. Uh, and then you scrape away the bits that are where the binding should be. So you're just like cutting the paint off, you know, just kind of scraping the paint off uh, where you want the binding to show through. And I thought that was interesting because I always kind of figured you'd want to apply the binding, you know, last or whatever. but. Um, to actually do it beforehand. And so if you look at um, Jim Hall's DeQuisto, and then later he had uh, a custom model made by Sadowski, uh, you'll see that he has no binding uh, visible. But there's actually binding there. But when uh, DeQuisto was showing Jim the guitar in its sort of not quite final state. Jim thought, hey, I like the way that looks better without the binding. So just don't scrape the paint away. And that became uh, Jim Hall's kind of signature uh, look, which is pretty cool. All right, it seems like the glue is holding where I want it to, and then it is mostly off, or at least it's you know, loose and thin enough to where I think I can go back to sanding. Yeah, gotta be careful. I don't wanna accidentally like, think I'm scraping glue off when I'm actually just scraping like liquefied binding. <laughs> that would not be good. Um, okay. Let's see here. Let's see how we get on with this. Yes, that's cool stuff. Uh, so, like Ken Parker's thing is like uh, is is reducing weight as much as possible. Yeah, I think I'm messing up the actual binding material, so I got to be careful. Um, he cares a lot about creating as resonant an instrument as he can, which usually means getting as much stuff 
off of the top, the vibrating part of the guitar, uh, as possible. Uh, and so he, uh, his story is when he had built his first arch top, um, and he was learning sort of uh, from Jimmy DeQuisto before he actually went to study with him personally, because Jimmy had done some articles, I think, uh, in magazines kind of talking about his process. And so Ken kind of learned from him through those articles and built a guitar. And then he managed to show it to Jimmy. And it was so light and so resonant that it was just unlike anything that Jimmy had ever seen. Uh, and Jimmy says something like, you know, there's no market for this guitar. <laughs> like nobody wants an instrument that is this resonant, like that rings this much. Uh, but then he said, you know, how long have you been building guitars? And, and Ken's like, well, this is my first one. <laughs> and so Jimmy was clearly impressed by his uh, building ability and ended up uh, sort of mentoring him. Uh, and I guess Ken effectively became his apprentice. Uh, but so that's kind of Ken Parker's thing is like, if you look at the fly, which is not an arch top guitar, um, it's neat because it's kind of, uh, kind of curved like inward, I guess on an, on the back to kind of, keep it as thin as possible uh, just so that the wood would vibrate more. Uh, and then of course it, that it would be light, like it's comfortable to, to sit and play is the idea. All right, I'm thinking this is working. I think we're ready to just go all in on the sanding. Try to destroy as little as possible, but there's still some glue on the binding material itself, which is concerning. So if you watch this channel and you see like um, you may have even seen like um, oh, what's his name? Foreman, something Foreman did a video showing off of Ken Parker guitar, and then Bill Frizzell did one as well. And the guitar is very cool because uh, Ken likes to use carbon fiber in his builds. I think he calls it something else because he, he came up with whatever the idea was. It's carbon fiber, but with like additional glass thrown in or something like that. So it's very strong and very light. So. He uh, has this really neat system to where, like, the neck, because when you're trying to adjust the action on a guitar, you've got the body uh, and then the neck sitting there. <laughs> and uh, usually what you want to do is, is angle the neck, the whole neck. You want it to be pretty much straight, and then you want it to be able to go like this. And then there are other factors like the nut a little bit, and then certainly the saddle. Um, the bridge and the saddles that can go up and down. But the neck angle is kind of the main one. And usually what we do uh, with more traditional guitars is we adjust the truss rod, which is not actually angling the uh, fretboard. It's just bending it. Like it's kind of doing this. That's bending it forward or back. So the truss rod, even though it's used commonly to make uh, action adjustments is actually not really for that. It's just for keeping the, you know, allowing you to keep the neck from, you know, turning into a banana over time. Because naturally with the pressure or the, uh, the weight of the, the strings pulling from the neck to the bridge uh, is going to pull on that neck quite a bit over time so then you can use the truss rod to get yourself back to straight but it's not actually the best way to theoretically to um, make action adjustments so ken's idea is he has this he has the body of the guitar and then there's like a where the neck would usually 
bond with the guitar, whether it's bolted on like a Fender or whether it's set like a Gibson and many other guitars, uh, which means that it's, uh, you know, glued in place and sometimes even bolted in place and then finished over. So it looks like it's all one piece. Uh, he has it to where there's kind of like this uh, bolt that goes through the whole guitar. So it's, it's accessible from the underside. It goes all the way up through and connects to the, uh, this like carbon fiber rod kind of uh, that is connected to the neck. And so the neck is actually itself not connected <laughs> to the guitar body. It's connected to this piece of carbon fiber and then the carbon fiber is connected to the body. And what that allows him to do is make these adjustments like this of the neck. You can make it go up and down and angle all kinds of places by adjusting this, uh, this bolt that he's got on there and uh and then that way you can have more control over your uh your neck angle and therefore your action which is pretty smart like watching his videos will make you go man i wish more people just made guitars like this like he just has really thought of everything seemingly. And then like, instead of putting us uh, like F holes in, he had this whole great talk I saw from some, it was a YouTube video of like a guitar builders conference or something. And he talks about uh, F holes on guitars, which of course look cool. Like they're made to look a lot like the you know, violins and double basses and violas and stuff, cellos. Um, but that for guitar is actually not really the best thing. <laughs> it looks neat, but it actually uh, contributes to feedback rather than, uh, I don't know, having the opposite effect. It wouldn't be designed to have the opposite effect, but it, it causes more problems than it solves. It's just sort of a... a an aesthetic thing uh, and that's why I like arch top guitars one of the reasons why arch top guitars can be a pain to sort of wrangle because they uh, they feed back so much so you got to be really careful how you position your amp and your volume and all that kind of stuff true of any acoustic guitar and an arch top is essentially an acoustic guitar that we just often put pickups in um, so instead of that, F holes, he puts a hole, he has like, if you're looking down on a guitar that's kind of facing this way, uh, and looking at sort of the thickness of the body, uh, he has another carbon fiber thing where it's wood everywhere else, but then at the sort of the hip, the top bout of the guitar, the edge of it is made of, I think, the same carbon fiber material, kind of like conforms to the shape of the guitar. Uh, and then around it, beneath it, and then above it, uh, it's cut away. So that uh, carbon fiber piece just sort of helps to uh, keep the guitar structurally sound. Um, but he allows the, the sound holes effectively to be actual just like big holes in the body of the guitar which is really neat uh, and i've seen some guitars i think the first time i saw it was on a uh, borgias or bourgeois i think you say borgias guitars um, that kind of i think they might have pioneered or at least popularized this sort of um, personal monitor so like again if you're looking down on the uh, sort of edge or the side of the guitar, uh, they would put a sound hole there. Sometimes they would also put a sound hole where you would normally have a sound hole. But so that way the music projects out like a normal acoustic guitar, but then it also projects up so that you, the player, uh, can hear yourself, which I think is a really neat idea. And I would like to see more guitars do it. All right, so this is 2000. I believe I've got the glue off just about, and it's cleaned up the edge 
I was worried I was really destroying the binding, but it looks like that's still good. Uh, and then let's go to 3,000, just as high as I go, I can go. Yeah, Ken Parker's a real character. Like, not only does he is he extremely interesting in how he approaches guitar building, and so certainly uh, incredibly knowledgeable. Uh, he's also pretty entertaining. So I highly recommend you check out. Uh, I might start with one of his talks rather than going straight to the Arch Toppery series because um, his talks really do a good job of showing his expertise as well as his personality. And then you can get more into the weeds with the Arch Toppery stuff, kind of watch him uh, slowly build a guitar. Okay, this looks really good. This looks really good. I've got some more work to do. But like, generally speaking, it's flush. I'm not seeing those uh, gaps like I was seeing. The other side needs work. Um, but this is looking good to me. Uh, but this is not going to be super exciting for very long if you're even still here. So what I might do is cut here and do my last bit of finishing up finish up the other side, and then we'll see where we are. And we'll check in then. Uh, so I'll see you in a bit. And we're back. And I only injured myself a little bit. So this is looking pretty good. It feels nice and smooth. I got the majority of the glue off. This is the back. So I'm not going to worry too much about that. But on the front, it's looking nice. Pretty good. And as I expected, anticipated, um, all that sanding has made this surface pretty dull. So that's why I got the polish. I'm hoping that will help uh, shine it back up, at least this side. I don't need to worry about the underside. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to do something that's maybe a bad idea, <laughs> which is the theme of this um, video. So I talked about how this piece of binding on this side doesn't quite line up with the, um, the main tortoise shell part of the pick guard. And it doesn't matter. You know, functionally, it matters not at all. I know that. But I can see it. And that bothers me. So I think I'm going to try to sand it down a little bit um, just to kind of make it flush. It doesn't need to be much. I don't really want it to be much of an angle, but we're going to see how we get along here. So how do I want to do this? It's going to be more of like an illusion. Like, I'll know that it doesn't really line up, but I'll be able to sort of convince myself that it does. Sometimes that's enough. I don't want to do too much. I just want to make it a little rounded, almost imperceptibly. A little bit more. Nope. OK. 
Okay, let's see, what do we got? Yeah, just a little curve. Um, all right, now we'll give it the, the fine buffing treatment I've been doing for the rest of it. Which is 800, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. Seems to be a good course. Okay, thousand. Yeah, just want it to be smooth, you know. Don't want any jagged edges if I can help it. And I'll try to be cognizant of the edge. I did have to. Uh, uh, sand around the edge because my prior sanding was so amateur. 2000 now, almost done. And then for good measure, we'll go up to three. More like a buffer than anything else. Yeah, it's looking good. Seems like you can kind of just run this over whatever you want. And it won't do too much harm. It'll even do some good. All right, so last pass here. And then we'll give the polish a chance. All right, let's see. Let's dry this bad boy off. Yeah, it's pretty good. Doesn't look like I did anything weird to it. A bit of weirdness here at the edge. That's about as good as we're going to do. And it just started raining, which is lovely. All right, so across the edge, feels smooth. Is it as professionally smooth as the Japanese guitar builders did on the rest of it? No, but that's OK. And the back doesn't need to be super pretty because it wasn't pretty in the first place. But that feels pretty good. And again, it's in a lined up um, angle like that. You know, it's straight. It's not higher or lower on any side. And I managed to file a little bit of a curvature there. You cannot see it. Uh, anyway, yeah, a little bit of a curvature there, just so it's, I don't know, maybe that's stupid, but too late. All right, so now let's just polish it, see how we get on with that. All right. Um, it's supposed to be polish that works well on plastic. Um, let's see. Okay. They say you don't need very much, and I believe them. So I've got a, like a guitar, not that it matters, but like a 
chamois guitar cleaning cloth here. So I'm just gonna put some polish on this. Let's see how we get on with that amount for now. Getting shiny. Oh yeah, that's working great. Cool. All right, we're gonna need more, but that's good. How are we looking? Yeah. It's all right. <clears throat> Keep going. Bottom edge. So I've got a buddy who, and I think this is common, and this is not even, this is sometimes me, uh, is af afraid to really do any work on his guitars. And I totally understand that. I had students when I was back teaching who would take their guitars to a music store to get them restrung. Which if you've never done it, you know, I get it. It seems scary. One, because you're dealing with metal and a lot of tension, so that's scary. Uh, even though it's exceedingly rare that anything uh, bad would happen. I have been playing for 20 some odd years and I've never had a string like snap and hit me <laughs> or anything like that. Um, and then there's the concern about, like, well, I don't want to buy these strings and then mess it up and then wait, you know, have to break a string while I'm trying to put them on or whatever. Anyway, the point being, people don't want to work on their own instruments, which I understand to a degree, but I think there are a lot of things that people should try that are relatively low risk. First of all, you should learn how to change your own strings. Definitely. Definitely. At least if you learn nothing else about guitar maintenance, you should learn how to change your own strings because it's not very hard and uh, it's necessary a lot of the time. Um, and then another thing that's often uh, scary is uh, setups, especially like truss rod adjustments, which I was also scared about when I first started. Um, but it's not it's not that big of a deal. It's you know, if you read one article or how-to about how to do it, 
the main thing is go slow. Don't make huge adjustments. Just go really slow and see how it goes. And then adjust again, you know, but don't be afraid to do it. Like a lot of guitars, especially higher end guitars, uh, come with a truss rod wrench in the case when you buy it. So the expectation is certainly that you can make that adjustment yourself. You don't need to take it to somebody to get your truss rod adjusted. Um, and then another thing is uh, on electric guitars, especially, they often have adjustable bridges, uh, which like Archtop has like a, a, a wooden bridge that has these uh, metal thumb wheels on either side. And as you adjust them, it raises and lowers either side of the bridge. And then some arch tops and, and most uh, electric guitars have a like a two nomadic bridge or something similar, uh, which gives you fine grain control over all six strings. You can raise and lower uh, each thing. You can shorten and lengthen each thing individually. And again, it's just a screwdriver <laughs> often. It's not a complicated adjustment. And uh, as you play more and more, the more years you put into the instrument, I think the more you develop your tastes, what you like as far as the feel, certain strings that you like, and picks and all that good stuff. Um, so once you develop those personal tastes, you know, within reason, I feel like you should be able to and not be afraid to make those adjustments yourself. Uh, I remember going to a music store one time and let's see, asking the guitar tech there, like how he got into doing guitar work. And he was like, I bought the cheapest guitars I could find at uh, yard sales and stuff, and I just experimented. And I'm, you know, there's plenty of, there are plenty of publications out there uh, for how to to do certain things. But um, like anything, you're not really going to learn properly until you do it, and that often means that you're going to make mistakes. So buy cheap guitars and mess them up, right, if you have to. Best case scenario, you don't mess it up, and then now you know what you're doing. But there's no real way to get around that. Like, I don't know any, uh, like, hairstylists or barbers, but I imagine, like, they have, well, I know that they have um, those, like, haircut practice mannequin heads right uh and then once you graduate from that point you go to like offering free haircuts or whatever or very low cost haircuts meaning people sort of know that they're dealing with a student you know uh and then you graduate to being confident because you've had the opportunity to make those mistakes Um, so when I got a, I'm just going to kind of give this whole thing a once over, I think, yeah. Um, so I bought an, uh, a classical guitar, like, I don't know. Well, okay, so I bought that uh, Fender Jazzmaster, which I didn't have for very long. As you know, if you watch my blog vids, um, and it required a lot of, you know, sort of fiddly work. Uh, it required it because I had certain expectations, certain um, criteria that I wanted to, it to meet that uh, doesn't happen kind of out of the box or out of the factory or whatever. 
by default. So I understood kind of going in that I was going to have to do a little bit of work to, to customize it, to kind of get it to where I wanted to go. And ultimately, I decided that even half, after having done all that stuff, I uh, just didn't really like the guitar that much. Which, uh, but that was a really good experience, you know. It was a costly experience uh, financially, but it was a fun one for me because I learned how to do things like shimming a uh, bolt-on neck, which later on, uh, years later, I ended up getting a guitar that has like individual piezo pickups uh, for each string. So the saddles of, the, of each string are not really adjustable, uh, but the neck angle wasn't where I wanted it to be. But thankfully, this guitar has a bolt-on neck. So I was able to pop the neck off, slide in a shim, and make that adjustment. And so I'm really glad that I was not too afraid to dive in when I got the Jazz Master, or I would not have known to do that. And I might have, I don't know, either had to had to take it to somebody and pay, or like decide that I don't like it and return it or something like that, you know, whatever. And there's validity to all of those things, like absolutely take your guitar into a tech for you know, serious repairs and even minor repairs if you don't have the confidence yet, but I just would urge you within reason to not be too afraid to make small adjustments and repairs and things to your instruments, especially as you go along and you become more opinionated through experience as to what you want your instrument to feel like and sound like. All right, so um, let's see if I can catch it in the light here. Yeah, so it's not 100% scratch free, but it looks more organic, <laughs> right? It looks more like um, you know, scratches you would get through playing. Uh, there aren't like big, ugly sanding marks or anything like that. And it feels good. Again, around the edges, there's very little texture to it. It's just smooth. Um, it's not the cleanest job ever. But I think there comes a time <laughs> when you need to stop fiddling with a thing because you're just going to end up making it worse. So right now, I think I have made it better. Uh, and it's good on the other side too. A little bit rougher, but it was a rough anyway because they don't finish the underside. Like the binding that came from the factory is not super clean on the backside because there's no point. Um, but yeah, so importantly, I think this looks nice enough and is sturdy enough. The glue is holding. It's not wiggly. It's flush. Um, it's a good enough job that I'll feel comfortable putting this back on the guitar and going from there. So this has been a long video of a lot of just sort of silence as I polish or sand, but I appreciate anyone who stuck it out to the end. This has been fun. And uh, the message I'll leave you with is don't be afraid to do this kind of stuff for your instruments. The more you, it's kind of like a car, I guess, if you get into repairing your own car, even if it's just like changing the oil or replacing fluids or whatever, like just a small amount of something can just kind of almost endear you to the thing a little bit more. Like you're showing a, a certain level of care to the thing. Um, even if you're not like a car person or a guitar person, you know, you are capable of this type of stuff. All right, that's it. Thank you for watching. I will see you all later. Bye-bye. All right. Thought I would just do a little postscript here to show off the guitar. 
Uh, put the pick guard back on. You can see it's pretty shiny. Anyway, right? Looks fine. Feels good. Um, and then just more generally, here's the guitar, <laughs> right? This is the uh, AF200, and I'm really enjoying it. And I like it even better now with the pick guard on. Uh, anyway, yeah, thanks uh, everybody for watching that very long video, but I think this was pretty fun, and I'm pretty happy with the result, and more generally, this guitar is really great, <laughs> so I'm happy. Uh, that's it. That's really it. All right. Take care, guys. Bye.